Hello everyone, my name is John McAleer and I'm an Associate Professor of Imperial and Global History here at the University of Southampton. Today I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the East India Company, a subject that I research and write about and that I teach in many of my modules. And so for the next 25 minutes or so, I want to give you an insight into this trading company established in London in 1600 and which grew over the course of the next few centuries to become a really important commercial organization. In many ways, it was the forerunner of the modern global multinational corporation. But it was also a vital political and military agent helping to lay the foundations of the subsequent British Empire in Asia. Before we delve into this history, however, um, I've got a question for you. Um, you might be sitting there thinking, oh, I've never heard of this thing, the East India Company, but have you seen Pirates of the Caribbean? If so, then you will be familiar with the East India Company because it's the shadowy corporate villain in pursuit of Captain Jack Sparrow, a.k.a. Johnny Depp. So even if you have managed to avoid Pirates of the Caribbean, you might have found yourself watching the BBC drama Taboo. Um, it appeared a few years ago. I got Tom, uh, Tom Hardy and Jonathan Price as the lead actors in it. Let me give you another connection. You might not want to admit that you've watched Pirates of the Caribbean or that you've seen Taboo, but I'm willing to wager that at some point in your life, you've had a cup of tea. In fact, you might be sitting there listening to this lecture with a cup right in front of you. Um, and that's all thanks to the East India Company. So we've all heard of the company or been affected by its activities and its histories, even if we weren't quite aware of it. And in this lecture, then, I want to suggest to you that the story of the East India Company is, in fact, much more interesting than anything that Disney or BBC can offer. Um, it's a story of wealth, power and the pursuit of profit. Here is a corporation that can strike its own coins, that can print money in effect. In a nutshell, this was a private British corporation with its headquarters in the city of London that traded with Asia and introduced spices, textiles and tea to this country. But that very brief summary belies its historical importance. The scale and activity and impact of the company's operations altered the lives of millions of people across many continents. In Britain, it changed what we eat and what we drink, how we dress, the words we use, the attitudes that we um, hold towards other people and societies. And as I say, it ultimately laid the foundations for Britain's 19th century empire in India. But it also had an impact in Asia, obviously. Calcutta, the great Victorian city of palaces, would never have developed in the way that it did without the East India Company. And even something like the ultra-modern skyline of today's Hong Kong that you can see here, well, Hong Kong only exists as a result of the East India Company's activities, its trade in tea, and the darker side of that story, its trade in opium. And the impact of the East India Company isn't just evident in physical remnants or political legacies. If I were to ask you to name a corporation that started off small, grew very large, bit off more than it could chew, but became so important to the British economy that it became too big to fail and required a government bailout, you would say, of course, the East India Company. But the echoes of those uh, relationships between business and politics survive with us to the present day and were seen as recently as a great financial crisis of the last decade where um, an organisation like the Royal Bank of Scotland um, also bit off more than it could chew and had to be bailed out by the government, um, as these headlines suggest. Um, so the point here is really that the history of the East India Company is still very relevant for us today. Okay, so what am I going to cover in today's lecture? This is a taster lecture after all, so I've taken that phrase very literally and I've tried to organise the story of the company's um, history, the trajectory of its activities over the course of three centuries according to chronology, geographical place and the commodity that the company is trading. Um, but I want to step outside that content at various points and give you a sense of what the historian does and how we do it. Um, in other words, how using historical sources um, helps us to piece this history together. Um, so we'll do that at various 
at various points. For starters, though, I need to give you a, a sense of um, where the East India Company operated. Um, the company was granted, as we'll hear, a monopoly on all English trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. Now, if you think about it, and if you've been paying attention in geography lessons, I guess everywhere is east of the Cape of Good Hope eventually. Um, but what that Monopoly was referring to was this part of the world, the Indian Ocean world, uh, which stretches from the Cape of Good Hope and the southern, uh, uh, the southern tip of Africa, um, across the East African um, coast, the Arabian Peninsula, with India sitting at the heart of this maritime world, through Southeast Asia, the Chinese coast, and right up to Japan. So this is the area that the East India Company um, operates in. Okay, let's move on to the first century of the company's existence. Um, and that's when it's focusing principally on Southeast Asia, today's Indonesia, um, and looking for spices like pepper, nutmeg, and mace, the kind of things that are very valuable in Western Europe at the time, um, but that only grow in, in, in Southeast Asia, so require um, the transportation of goods across long, long distances. Okay, um, here is exhibit A. Um, I might call it. This is, uh, don't worry, this is not an, an eyesight test, by the way. Um, the slide is, is quite pixelated, but um, you have to take my word for it. It shows you a list of subscribers to the East India Company. Um, it's a list of names. It extends over several pages. I'm just showing you the first page. A list of names, um, merchants of the City of London, and beside each of their names is a, an amount of money. Um, and that's the amount of money that they're willing to subscribe to fund this voyage to Asia, this venture, this enterprise that they want to undertake. They're essentially having a whip around. Um, they're the original venture capitalists. Um, and what they're doing is trying to raise money. It comes to £65,000 in total, which is a lot of money. Um, in 1600 uh, and they're going to use that money to fund ships and to fund an expedition um, now the eagle eyed among you might have uh, spotted that at the top of the document and um, you can just about make out the date 1599 and that's because they gather their subscriptions in 1599 but they need to get permission to launch this venture and they get permission from the queen queen elizabeth the first um, and she grants this company of merchants trading to the East Indies, as they call themselves, she grants this group of people um, a monopoly on all English trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and they're allowed to do something very unusual, which is to take money out of the kingdom, to take money out of England to pay for goods. Now, um, that's the kind of birth cert, if you want, of the East India Company. Let's just pause there briefly and think about this as a kind of historian, as university his historians, academic historians. It's by asking questions of documents like this, of evidence like this, that we can start to build up a picture of who these people were, where they lived, what their motivations were, and so on. Because we've got lists of names, we can match those up with um, lists of professions, and we can get a sense from the amount that they are subscribing to the venture, how much they're able to afford, and so on and so forth. So I guess there's a point here uh, about um, the work of a uh, historian at, at university. If you go to school to learn, you come to university to learn how to ask questions, I, I guess. And it's kind of asking those questions of these primary sources that we, we do um, throughout our courses and throughout our modules here at, at Southampton using primary documents um, like this one, mainly um, published in, in, in kind of modern script as it were, so you don't need to worry about trying to decipher the handwriting. Let me just make a, another point about source documents and, and archives and, and the like. Um, you might think that the most important thing about St Pancras Station is uh, platform uh, nine and three quarters. Well, actually, for me, the most important thing about St Pancras Station is one of the buildings close by, um, the British Library, and actually what's underneath the British Library and what's underneath the Euston Road there. Um, in the basement of the British Library, you've got all of these documents um, which detail the history of the East India Company which can detail the history of Britain's centuries-long connection with India. The company, after all, was a business enterprise. It kept records of everything that it did. Um, so from the very first document, that birth cert of the East India Company, right up to the very end days of, of the company, they documented and recorded everything they did. And if you put all of their documents on one single shelf, 
um, from beginning to end. That would stretch for 14 kilometers. It's a huge amount of documentary evidence that we can draw on to piece this history together. And that's the work of many, many lifetimes. Um, so, so it's not something that any one of us can do, but by choosing and selecting carefully those documents, which is what we, we do as university lecturers, um, we can then kind of present those documents to, to seminars and have a really good discussion and debate about the kind of issues and themes arising from those. So it's by drawing on these primary source documents that we can structure our seminars and our discussions. So let's um, press on pause, as it were, and move back to the story of the East India Company. And let me turn to um, a story um, that I made earlier, as, as it were, um, and it's a story surrounding this man, James Lancaster, who leads the very first East India Company voyage to Asia. So he's the person uh, that the company choose to spend their £65,000, as it were. He's the man who leads four ships and takes them to Asia looking for spices. Um, he's from Basingstoke. Um, he also bizarrely looks like my old maths teacher, so I'm not going to spend too long um, talking about him. I've just got a few points to make here that will illuminate our understanding of the company more generally. Um, the first point is that it takes him a very, very long time to get to Asia and back again, 954 days to be precise. And we know this because we've got letters and diaries and journals that are kept by Lancaster and by other people on his expedition. So, so we know that to be the case. Um, in other words, this is not a short-term venture. It's something that you're going to have to invest in for the long term if you're the East India Company. Um, it's not a, an easy or a quick return. And the second thing to say about Lancaster's venture is there was nothing successful about it, apart from the fact that he actually made it home after 954 days, nearly three years. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm saying that, um, well, I can prove it because we know that he lost several ships um, during the voyage to storms and shipwreck and the like. He lost several hundred men to disease. Um, he wasn't very good at um, trading with Asian merchants, so he brought them heavy English tweed, which the merchants of Southeast Asia, surprise, surprise, didn't particularly want to buy. Um, he wasn't very good at negotiating for the spices and pepper um, that he was asked to bring back to England. Um, and the pepper that he did bring back to England proved to be worthless because in the meantime, um, people had bought their pepper requirements from the Dutch who had um, arrived back in Europe um, much sooner than Lancaster. So the point here is that he wasn't very successful um, and the East India Company, um, there was no inevitability about its rise to dominance. So we're going to hear a little bit later in the lecture about um, the company's rise to power and the fact that it became this kind of territorial empire, laid the foundations of the British Raj, but there was nothing inevitable about that at the beginning of its career. So I, I kind of wanted to, 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 to make that point to you and, and we can tell that and we can kind of draw those um, conclusions from looking at the documents, the letters, the journals, the diaries that are kept on his venture. Um, just to make the point that it's not just all about one man in the 17th century, um, I'm showing you here uh, two pages from the journal of another East India Company man, a sailor called Edward Barlow. Um, and he's actually, we've got a, a modern day transcription uh, of Edward Barlow's journal in our library, the Hartley Library, one of the um, best um, kind of academic libraries in, in the country. Um, and Barlow's journal here that you can see is, well, on the left hand side, it's describing and showing us um, Madras, or Fort St. George, um, the East India Company's fortified settlement on the east coast of India. That would grow up to become the city we know today as Chennai. And on the right hand side, um, I'm showing you a picture that, yes, it does show a rhinoceros. That is what you're seeing there. Um, and Barlow tells us that the rhinoceros came back with him on his East India Company ship and was put on display in London. And this is really um, interesting because um, perhaps it sounds far fetched to you. It's bizarre. Um, rhinoceros sharing a berth on a ship coming back to London. But being good historians, um, we know that we can check this out by comparing our evidence. 
by um, kind of checking our sources, as it were. And if you look at the diary of another 17th century contemporary, a man called John Evelyn, you'll find that he describes going to see a rhinoceros in the city of London, paying a shilling to view this animal. And he tells us that it was lately brought back from the East Indies. So by comparing and kind of matching up these sources, Barlow's journal that I'm showing you here, John Evelyn's diary, we can pretty much say for certain that this event did happen. We can prove that it took place. And what does it mean for us, can our broader understanding of the East India Company? Well, it tells us that the company is not just bringing back commodities. It's not just bringing back pepper to put on your dinner. Um, it's bringing back knowledge and information too. So it's an important source of new knowledge and new information for people back in Europe. Okay, let's move on to the next century of the company's existence, the 18th century, the 1700s. And here is where the East India Company becomes a cloth merchant to the world. It starts supplying textiles in huge quantities. In one year alone, 1750, the East India Company imports 5,000 miles of textiles. That's enough to stretch from London to Cape Town. It's a huge amount of textile. Now, if you think about it, um, remember Lancaster? He's going to Southeast Asia and he's bringing heavy English tweed. There isn't much variety in European cloth at the time. So when East India Company merchants arrive in India um, and they're initially looking for spices, pepper, nutmeg, and so on, um, when they arrive in India, they are their eyes are suddenly opened to the great variety of Indian textiles, um, light, easy to wear, colourful, in complete contrast to what's available in Europe. And the kind of words that we use for these textiles, chintz, calico, pyjama, gingham, dungaree, seersucker, those kind of words that you might be familiar with today, well, all of those words were imported um, by the East India Company and into the English language, along with the textiles that they describe. Um, so you can see the company being um, a, a clever commercial organisation immediately sees an opportunity. Um, this is its next great business opportunity and it seizes it um, and it affects all levels of society and this is the point that I want to make to you here using this piece of um, evidence. This is a primary source too just like the document that I showed you earlier. This is a sailor's bandana or a neckerchief um, and although it's a physical object it's also a kind of text that we can read and interpret as historians. And what it tells us is that this um, bandana was worn by a man called Samuel Enderby. Uh, he was an ordinary sailor, um, served in the Royal Navy and was present at the Battle of Trafalgar, um, where Nelson led the Royal Navy's fleet into battle against the French and Spanish combined naval forces off the, co uh, off the coast of Spain. Now, um, there's nothing more European, you might say, than a war between Britain, France, and Spain, um, the Royal Navy taking part in a great set-piece battle off the coast of Europe. And yet one of the sailors was wearing this this object, this this bandana, produced in Kazim Bazar in today's Bangladesh um, and imported by the East India Company. So the point here is that Samuel Enderby or somebody that knew him or was part of his family was willing to buy this object and Enderby was willing to wear it. Um, so it gives you a sense of um, the influence of the East India Company and its commercial activities. Now, as well as having an impact on um, consumer patterns of behaviour here in Europe, the East India Company obviously had a massive impact on Asia and on India in particular. So I'm, I'm showing you here a print of Fort St. George, um, which, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, was a fortified warehouse or factory. Um, and around Fort St. George grew up the city of Madras. And if you think about the three great coastal cities of India today, Kolkata, Chennai and Mumbai, um, those three great cities, um, I guess, began life as um, East India Company um, settlements or at least fortified warehouses settled um, quite close to indigenous v villages that then grew up into these um, huge uh, modern um, global metropolises that we know that we know today. Um, so the company has a huge impact both on Europe and on India. Now moving quickly on um, to the last great commodity um, that the East India Company is involved in trading in. Um, and that's tea. Uh, 
East India Company, one of its great, um, I guess, successes is that it recognizes and realizes what its consumers want before they know themselves. Um, it's a little bit like Apple uh, of making its iPhone 54 or whatever it is. The East India Company also recognizes that we're going to want this thing, tea, before we know about it ourselves. It recognizes that tea would be a great commercial boost for the company and it changes our uh, domestic habits in Britain. It changes what we drink. Um, instead of having beer for your elevenses, you now have tea for your elevenses, generally. Um, it's very difficult to have afternoon tea without the tea, and so on and so forth. Um, so to give you a kind of statistical, um, a piece of st st statistical evidence to prove this, um, let me refer to um, the amount of imports that the company um, was involved in um, in 1700. So the importation of tea in 1700 amounted to only a few hundred pounds of tea. Um, by 1800, so just a century later, the East India Company is importing 25 million pounds of tea every year. It's a huge leap um, and, as I say, had a massive um, impact on our domestic rituals in this country. Also, of course, had a, a major impact on the East India Company's um, profits. And it also had a very beneficial effect for the government's treasury because the tax taken on tea was substantial and every pound of tea imported by the East India Company yielded tax for the British government. So a lot of um, kind of overlapping interests there. And I guess the ultimate takeaway from this is that the East India Company's involvement in the tea trade began Britain's long and tempestuous relationship with with China. Um, it was the only place that you could source tea in the 18th century during the kind of heyday of the East India Company was China. Um, but that's that's another story, um, uh, and perhaps for for another day. Um, I want to return now um, to conclude the lecture um, by giving you a sense of the way that the company um, helps to found the British Empire in Asia. Um, the way that the company kind of um, lays the foundations of the British Raj in India. Um, so a few things to say about the East India Company um, as it rises to power throughout the 18th century and what it gets up to and how it changes in, in nature. The first thing to say is that the company um, gets heavily involved in Indian politics. It starts to dabble or meddle in Indian politics. It starts to fight um, battles on Indian soil. I'm sure you hear a picture um, which represents the aftermath of something called the Battle of Plassey, which took place in 1757. Very important battle. Um, the company would say that it waged that um, battle in order to secure its commercial interests, its trading power in northeast India, in Bengal. Um, but it had many, many more political ramifications for the company because it can suck the company into Indian politics. It, it made the company a player on the Indian political stage. So the company is becoming a, a kind of political player, a political agent. Um, it's a company that is able to mint money. Uh, it's able to strike coins, as we said um, at the very beginning. It starts to control increasing amounts of territory. I'm showing you a map here um, representing the extent of the East India Company's territory in 1800. So the red bits on the map suggest that it's British territory. Um, it's actually East India Company um, territory. Um, so you can see the company is starting to extend its influence inland, starting to take over um, particular parts of the Indian subcontinent. Um, it's starting to develop cities. So the city of um, Calcutta, as we saw earlier, is being developed by the East India Company. And all of these things, I think, um, suggest that it is acquiring the trappings of statehood, as it were. Um, it's starting to um, take on the powers and responsibilities of a country, of a state. Um, so it's a bit weird. It's very weird, in fact. This is a private trading corporation that is now um, administering justice and collecting taxes in parts of India. Um, so a very strange um, beast indeed. Now, what is all this power based on? Um, well, it's partially based on consent and, and on politics and on using um, Indian middlemen um, to kind of a, a, um, consolidate its power in India. 
But the East India Company's control in India, its growing power um, and influence in the subcontinent continent is also based on the threat of violence carried by the East India Company's armies. So as well as being a company that can strike coins, that develop cities, um, that starts to control territory, this is a company that also has its own army and its own navy. Um, this is bizarre. Um, it's really strange. This is like Nike with a navy or Tesco with an army, if you think about it. Um, I'm showing you here a picture of um, a, a, a sepoy and, and his wife. Um, the sepoy is a private Indian soldier who is um, a member of the East India Company's army. And at the height of its powers, the East India Company had about a quarter of a million men in its armies. Now, that's five times the size of the British army at the time. So this is an enormous um, military force that the East India Company relies on um, and uses in order to consolidate and, in some cases, extend its power in Asia. Now, for a very long time, um, the sepoys, like the man that you can see here, found the East India Company to be a relatively good employer. Um, but when that starts to change, problems begin to emerge for the East India Company. And here we're beginning the, the kind of rocky descent of the East India Company into its decline and ultimate demise. Now, I don't have time in this very short taste lecture to go into the complicated and complex history of resistance to the East India Company in both India and in Britain. But suffice to say that the East India Company came under assault from many, many different quarters. Um, so people in Britain objected to a private trading company um, exercising the powers of a, of a state. The government in London was kind of wary of the East India Company getting too much power. And of course, people in India objected to the East India Company um, controlling territory and making demands on Indian weavers and on Indian you know, taxpayers and, and the like. Um, ultimately, however, um, matters came to a head in 1857 when uh, a mutiny uh, among uh, an army regiment broke out in northern India in Meerut near Delhi, and that sparked a much wider general rebellion or uprising. Um, so for our purposes today in thinking about the East India Company, um, the, the principal result of the events of 1857, and they're called various things, the Great Revolt, the Sepoy Mutiny, um, the First War of Indian Independence, and I think all of those names actually have a, have, have, have a certain amount of validity to them, um, but the principal result from our perspective, interested in the East India Company, was that it convinced the British government in Westminster that it had to quell the violence, suppress um, the uprising, and to abolish the East India Company. And that's exactly what they did. In 1858, the British government effectively abolished the East India Company, and it brought all of the assets and responsibilities of the East India Company back to Britain and, and, and placed them under the control of the British government, Queen Victoria's government, if you want. So the company Raj, the empire of the East India Company that I've tried to describe and chart for you over the course of this lecture, now became part of the British empire ruled by this lady, Queen Victoria. And that opened um, a new chapter in the history of the British empire in India. Um, and the chapter that I've just tried to describe to you, the, the chapter that was the East India Company as a kind of agent of expansion, imperialism, and globalization. Well, that chapter was over. But as I hope I've shown you, um, it still leaves lots and lots of questions and plenty of debates for historians like us to grapple with. So I hope that's given you a sense of this subject, just one among many hundreds that we study and research and teach here at Southampton. And I also hope that it's given you a sense of how we do it here at university. Thank you very much.